In a recent video where I was making some coffee, I demonstrated using this implement. It's called a VAR, T-V-A-R-E. And I used it for blending in the components and frothing the milk up. And it was especially effective. I don't think I could have done better with a store-made item, short of a nice little electric frother. But this worked very well. And the question I asked was, would you be interested in me showing you how they're made? So I have a number of people that are interested. So that's what we're going to do today. Keep watching. All right, so what is a VAR and why would you want to make one? Why not just go to the store and buy a whisk? Well, I brought a little whisk out with me. This is one I carry in my cook it. Only cost me a couple dollars from the dollar store. It works quite well for whipping up eggs and, uh, you know, blending flour and mixtures together like that, which is, of course, what you use a whisk for. So why not just stay with that instead of making one? Well, there's a couple reasons. First off, this specific one is much better at doing what I did with it in that other video, which I'll link at the end of this one if you're interested, in that it blends the milk and the oils and different things together so nicely and froth them up inside of a cup. Now it's not going to be as good for other tasks that I might need a whisk for so this is why I like that one for that task. But you know it's not the only one. I brought out a couple of others that I've made. I've probably made about a dozen over the last few years just kind of experimenting. Um, here's one that looks more like a traditional whisk and can be used like a traditional whisk. We'll talk about how to make one like that today. And here's one of my early ones. This is based on a very old Scandinavian design for a Dvar, T-V-A-R-E. In fact, that's where I first got the idea from. And this is just used for mixing. It could be used for mixing soups or stews together. It could be mixing flours together or beating up a batter for some type of a bread. And, you know, just blending things up together. And it's very, very easy to make. And you know what? If it breaks, they're easy enough to make another one. So the question I guess you're asking yourself is, why would I choose to make one like this if I can get one like this so cheap and it does a good job? Well, despite the fact that this does a better job at that one specific task, I like to make my own for this reason. Really, that's a bushcraft skill. It, it allows me to sit and enjoy my time carving a tool that I will then use while I'm out here in the woods. I feel it just connects me better with the woods and allows me to develop my knife handling skills and my understanding of the world around me out here, especially how wood reacts when you carve it. So it's not that you need to have one of these. It's not that it's better. It's just that it's more fun. Maybe that's the way to say it. So what I'll do now is I'll just talk a little bit about how I make mine, the different designs, what to look for, and we'll actually demonstrate making one or two. Okay, before we get started, let me just show you a few of the tools that you may need. And some of these are actually quite optional. You don't need a whole lot. The one thing you do need, of course, though, is a knife. And ideally, a very fine point knife like on a Mora. Now, this is an Izonda, a knife that I've been testing for a review. And this has a great fine point knife to allow me to do the carving I'm going to do. And it has a reasonably good sharp spine, which I'll be using as well. And I'll show you how that's done in a minute. Now. That's all you really need as far as cutting tools go, but uh, I'll tell you what makes it a lot easier. A pair of clippers like this, this a pair of loppers or pruning shears or whatever else you want to call it, and I'll show you why in a minute. It just makes it a little easier to cut the top of the conifer tree off than trying to work at it with a knife. Definitely much easier than using a saw for that reason. A couple of other things you're going to need is some type of cordage. Now I brought out three different pieces of cordage to show you and I'll show you the one that I'm probably going to use for this project only because well I'll get to why in a minute. Here's number 36 bank line just a little piece that's left in my cordage kit. Now this makes a good choice regardless because even if you want a finer piece of line and I'll tell you why in a minute in a minute it's easy enough to break this bound just by untwirling it and you get a couple of pieces inside that you can use for the project. So I'll probably, I will be using this today, but I do have some really, really ultra fine bank. I'm not even sure what number it is. I bought this a number of years ago and even this can be broken down. This is actually great stuff for repair on, uh, well, anything that needs repairs, I guess, but it's strong enough that I've done a lot of other bushcraft tasks that I don't even know where you might get something this fine anymore. I got it at a fishing supply store any number of years ago. And the last thing you could use, of course, is paracord. Not the whole thing, but maybe the inside strands of paracord. You could pull out one of those and th that'll work fine. I guess you could use the whole paracord, 
depends on the type of whisk you're going to make. So let me just show you the three whisks I have, and this will help you determine if you're going to need any cordage at all. Obviously, if you're making the most traditional of vars, you're not going to need any cordage at all. It's just, just a knife is all you really need. You could get by, it'd be helpful to have the clippers, but just a knife is all you're going to need. Now, if you're going to make this type, you do need a bit of cordage. And you can see I use some of that very, very fine bank line right there to hold the uh, tines. I don't know what you'd call them. The branches together to form the whisk shape. And this one. This one I did the same because actually this started out looking like this. And I decided to clip them off because I felt it would do the job better and it really, really did. So in order to get that into that shape, that umbrella shape, if you're holding it upside down like this, I needed to be able to pull the branches back. So a little bit of cordage. Now I'm gonna make one like this to, uh, today for later use. It won't be a finished product project, but we'll talk about that when we get to that point. But maybe this is where you wanna go, something more traditional. This also works. I'm not, not denying that, that it works. I just happen to like this style the best of the three that I've shown you. Okay, so the other thing you need is a top off of some type of a conifer tree. So I have experiment with all the different conifers that I could find around me here. And I cut the top off of three local trees just a few minutes ago rather than taking the time to do that on video. And I'll talk about the pros and cons and what to look for in choosing the conifer. But before I do that, I need to talk about cutting living trees because this is starts with a living tree that has to be quite malleable, flexible branches on it. So it does have to be still green. So here's what you need to know. If they're not yours on your property, then you need to get permission to do that. I have that here. I'm not on crown land. I, I'm not cutting down crown land, crown land trees. I'm on private property, so I'm able to do it. Now, I say that only because uh, somebody will, will call me out and say, why are you cutting a living tree? You're going to damage it. Uh, damage it? Yeah, technically, I am taking a little piece of the top of the tree off. I'm not hurting the tree significantly at all. It's not going to impair the growth or harm it or definitely not going to kill it. It's no more than picking the little tiny uh, new growth off of the ends to make a cup of tea. This really causes very little damage to the tree. Uh, and if that really does bother you, I'll give you another source of where you can find one. Your Christmas tree. If you use Christmas trees, now here in Nova Scotia we have a huge Christmas tree industry. We transport them or sell them around the world and they and the trees that they use here primarily with very few exceptions are balsam fir. Balsam fir is one of the best to use anyway because it's one of the easier to work with. So if you have a Christmas tree and you're getting ready to throw it out for in the garbage or whatever else you use it, we use the branches to cover plants up in our backyard but you might want to take a look at the top of the Christmas tree and see if it's symmetrical enough that you can use for doing this with. I just throw that out there. So what have I got? All right, so I'm going to show you the three that I have today and give you the pros and cons on each of it. <clears throat> so this is the top off of the uh, balsam fir tree that I cut. Now, I, this looks rather large, but I was looking for something specific and I can work it down in size as well. One of the things you're going to look for is the the branches that come out from the joint, and obviously this is the very top of the tree, grew up to here and I cut it off. If you're going to look for this, try to find one that has at least four, if not five or six branches coming out from that joint. I got lucky today, I got six six branches coming out from the joint. That's, I've never seen more than that, actually. I rarely see any that many. So, you know, kind of decide for yourself how big it's gonna be. A little bit of experience will help you there, but you might wanna decide. One of the things I've learned is that, um, oh yeah, you're gonna get gummy, by the way. Tastes good, but it's gonna make a mess. Um, one of the things I've learned is, is you eyeball it and it looks big enough and then you take all the bark off and then it dries, it gets smaller. So take that into consideration that your end product is going to be more narrow, the branches are going to be more narrow than it is when you start it. So that is a balsam fir. It's one of the easier ones to work with, but not the easiest. The easiest has to be a pine tree. So this is the top off of a white pine tree. And I know that because it has five needles on each fascicle. And I got lucky on this one. What did I get here? I got six, actually I got seven, but one of them's not very useful. I got seven branches off of the joint. See the little tiny one here? That's gonna go. I've never seen that many. I just 
this is, seems to be my lucky day. So that's a great choice. It's much easier to debark. The needles aren't, you know, a hassle to get off. Uh, it's still going to get a little gummy, but not as much as the balsam fir. And here's the third choice that I had today. This will work, but it's my least uh, favorite choices. This is the top off of a black spruce. Same deal. I, what did I get on this one? I got five. So not quite as many as you can see in the, uh, the jun junction there. Now the reason I say it's the last of the choices I have is it actually smells really nice, I, you know, and you could certainly make tea out of the tips off of this and you would love the flavor of it. It's just that it seems harder to work with for whatever reason. If you look, the needles run even up the main stem and they happen to be quite st uh, sturdy, quite thick. They're just a nuisance to get off not undoable. You can certainly do that, but it's just a little easier to do. It's the easiest to do it on the pine. Second easiest to do it on the balsam fir, and this would be my last choice. Now, these are not the only ones that you might find out in the woods. Uh, larch is another tree that is out here. I don't have any around me. I've just never found the top of a larch that worked like that, where you got four, five, or six uh, different branches coming out of the junction point. So just take a look around. We have other trees in Nova Scotia. We have white spruce. We have red spruce. Again, these are what I had literally almost at my feet. Within 30 feet, I cut all three of these off. So the one I'm going to work on today I think will be this one. This is the pine and I'll show you what to do next. All right, we're going to work with the white pine and I'm just looking it over and take your time to consider what your next steps are and what it is it's going to, you need to do. Don't be in a rush to cut the branches down to what you think the final size is. Leave extra length on. Easier to cut it off after the fact than it is to do, to add, well you can't add it back on, can you? So I'm just going to take and try it and probably I don't know, eight inches or so, maybe nine inches. I'm going to trim each of these off roughly, well, hopefully the, as close to the same length as I can reasonably eyeball. And they're not all the same thickness, which sometimes can be a bit of a nuisance, but, uh, you know, not too bad. Oh, yeah, that one got a little larger. Oh, yeah, there's that little tiny one inside there. I'm taking that off now because it'll only get in the way. Okay, so there you can see what I've done. I've cut it down to about eight, maybe nine inches on each of the off stalks off of the junction point. I'm also going to take off of the top of this just to make it easier to work with. I'm cutting it at about 12 inches. I'm definitely going to be shortening that down, but I just wanted to make it a little easier to work with. All right, so I've cut those off using the pruning shears, but I could have just as easily done that with a knife as well. All right. Next trick, remove the bark, or not next trick, next step, remove the bark. And there's no way around this. This is going to take a little bit of time. So, you know, you can start with the sharp edge of your knife. I'm not going to make you watch me do the whole thing. I'll just get started and then I'll cut away to the next step. Just take your time. This smells great. This is a great project right now because the smell is just amazing. Not sure if you can hear that. There has been a small flock of Canada geese flying back and forth over me here and uh, nice to see, but they can be a bit disruptive as well and loud. We call Canada geese flying death cobras here in Canada. Vicious animals if you get too close to them. Great to look at, but uh, don't approach. Very territorial and not afraid to attack. From personal experience I can tell you that. All right so I'll just work on this. I'm going to take all the little the needles off and then I'm going to scrape the bark right down to the bare wood and that's important to do. Get all the bark off now. I mean it's you can take it off after it's dry it's just harder. In fact if you don't take it off before you use it the first time you'll know because the first time you put this in something like hot water any bark left on gets mucky after the fact. So try to get it all off now. All right, I'll do that and I'll bring you back for the next step. All right, I have gotten most of the way. I'm not going to say all the way to what I would prefer to see my finished project look like, but I just want to speed things up a little bit for the video. So a couple of things here right off the top. I said you should have a very fine point knife, but I didn't explain why. So there's my knife. By the way, that's something we'll talk about what gets all over your knife in a moment. The reason you need a very fine point knife is in these little grooves right in here at the bottom 
a big fat pointy knife is just going to be too awkward and probably not going to get in far enough. Now, I shouldn't have to say this, but knife skills matter. This is a point or a time or a skill that you could easily cut yourself if you're not paying attention and not employing good safe knife skills. So do that, of course. So just take your time and here's a, here's a good kind of a guideline for you. If it's green, you haven't gone down far enough. You should have pretty much white wood. Now, I haven't done the best work yet on it. I'll tell you a little trick that I just used now. Um, I'm using the spine to get a little bit of green off of here. I just laid it down on my leg and actually pulled, not moving the knife back and forth, but pulled the branch back and forth. You can see I got some more of that inner bark off. Yeah, there's still some more work I could be doing. Now, if you don't get it off now, it's not the end of the world. You can get it off after you finish trussing this up into the shape you want. It's just going to be harder for you to do that. So as much time you put in now is going to save you time at the end. So I didn't work hard on the very tips because I know eventually I'm going to be cutting those off. So I'm not too worried about getting right out to the very end of these things. All right, now I mentioned this. Look at the knife. What a mess, right? Okay, the same thing with my hands. They are all sticky from the sap of this tree. Would have been worse ahead I've been using the balsam fir, but uh, pine is sticky enough. Little trick, I learned this one when I was a young fella, and we'd come in from playing in the woods, and my mother would look at us, and we would have black all over us because of the tars, and, or not the tars so much, but the sap and the dirt and everything else, butter. And that's what we used to have to wash our hands and often our face and other parts of our bodies with was butter to get it off. It seems to work very well. And then soap and water afterwards. Soap and water itself never seemed to work quite well. Rubbing alcohol, or in my case, I like to carry hand sanitizer. That works pretty good too. Butter or oil are the ones that seem to work the best. Not a bad thing to do with your knife as well. Just be careful when you're when you're taking that all off. Okay, so that's as far as I'm going to go with this today. Like I said, I could probably spend a little bit more time being a little bit fussier about getting the green off. And uh, it'll save me a little heartache later. Now, next step. I took that number 36 bank line and I split out one of the three twines as you can see right here. And now is, this is a little tricky, I don't mind telling you, you. And by the way, if you don't get this done right away, in other words, while the wood is still green, uh, it's gonna get a lot harder. You may not be able to get it back. The only trick I'll tell you then is to put it in steam or, or in hot water, boiling hot water, just to make them all pliable again. But you know, you could probably get this done fairly quickly like I just did, probably an extra 10 minutes off of camera. And what I'm doing now is kind of visualizing, bringing the ends together. They are fairly pliable, so it's going to work pretty good. This is where you'll know whether or not you cut any too short. Too long is good, too short, not so good. All right, so that's what it's going to look like. So how am I going to bind those up? So here's my suggestion. Kind of hold it in your hand and create a knot of some type. A clove hitch is ideal for this. Um, if you're looking for a final end product, then you're not taking this off, then maybe a whipping would be even a better choice. Uh, this, yeah, I don't mind telling you, this is a little finicky. I'll see if I can do this and then fix it up. So I'm wrapping it around to create a clove hitch. And back again. And through, let's see if I can get that through. And with sticky fingers, this is a pain. Now people might question a bank line itself, is that a good choice? Because it's, you know, it's a tarred nylon. Uh, you, you could use anything else you want. I'm just, I like bank line because I know at the end of the day, this is gonna be coming off. Oops, I missed a couple. I gotta open it up back up and get those inside. All right, let me work at this just for a second off camera, just to save a little bit of time, and I'll show you what it looks like when you get it properly bound up. Okay, full disclosure, I dropped the idea of a clove hitch. It's worked for me in the past, and it does work. I just found I thought I'd try something else that might work a little bit better, and that was a Canadian jam knot. So that's what I used, because I know it'll tighten up and apply pressure quite evenly and quite tightly. So, okay, here's what I've done now. The amount of time you want to do put into this to make this exactly what you want depends again on what your outcome is. Are you looking for a traditional looking whisk like this or do you want to end up with 
one like this. And this is what I am going for, is one like this. I don't find that I need anything quite like this when I'm out in the woods. I'm not mixing that many dry materials, but where's the other two that I had? Okay. So if I am whipping eggs up, this will work just fine for eggs. If I'm blending flowers together to make a bannock or something, this will work fine for this. But so will that. They will work just fine. What this will do better than that, though, is blending things into my coffee cup and frothing them up. This just doesn't seem to do as good a job. So that's why I prefer this style. So the amount of time you put into the finishing of this tying the knot up here it depends again on if you want this style or the other style that I prefer. Entirely up to you. So now I'm just looking to even and get these things to snug in. It's not supposed to be really big, right? That little skinny guy right there really wants to give me a little bit of grief. It's still green. I can still move him or it around and get it into a good position and then snug it down even more. Nice thing about the jam knot. Now if I was doing a whipping you could do the whipping around the outside. You still need to start it somehow so you know I can whip it around but that will be permanent on there I guess if you will and uh, that's an option. I've done that. It works like you can see it's not much different than what I've done right here. All right, basically at this point, your job is finished. All you need to do now is let it dry out. Okay, you don't have to let it dry. I can use this right now if I want, but if you let it dry out, uh, then of course it's going to, you're going to, well, one thing is you can finish taking off all the little pieces of inner bark like I've doing right now. Um, it's basically ready to go. Let it dry out and it will actually stay in that shape. Not if you untie it, it'll still spring back a little bit, but it will spring back less if it is dry than if you take it apart now. So ultimately my goal will be to allow this to dry and then I'll go around with either my knife or my pruning shears and I'll clip each of these off and they will have a curve so it'll end up looking something like this and that's like I said that's the one I like the most but here's what I'm going to suggest make a bunch have some fun with this make a bunch of different ones see what you like to do it's just a fun little craft that you can come up with that actually gives you a practical useful tool in the end now once it's dry not before once it's dry then you can come by and clip off all these extended ends as well all right simple project that's really all there is to it and uh, I just Open this up to you if you have any comments or questions on how I made this, any thoughts on how I can do it better or do it differently, then put all that in the comments section below. But until next time, get out and explore and take that path less traveled because it will make all the difference. Bye for now.